Okay, the meeting of the Donald Trump Appreciation Society will come to order. Uh, we have our handbook here, The Haircut Who Would Be King. But first, I'd like to hand out some song sheets. Now that we have a king in the White House, I have something called the Anthem for King Donald. I'll sing it first, so you know the melody, and then the second time around, we all sing. Okay? Um, the store's never seen anything like this before. Um, anthem for King Donald. Okay, here we go. When the Donald says he has the biggest base, we hail, hail, right in the Donald's face. Not to love the Donald is a great disgrace. So we hail, hail, right in the Donald's face. Donald Trump loves disorder. He wants to spread disorder. When we look at Donnie boy, oh goodness, what a joy. When he shoves down our throat, his disorder. When the Donald says he has the biggest base, we hail, hail, right in the Donald's face. Not to love the Donald is a great disgrace. So we hail, hail, right in the Donald's face. Now I would like that portion of this to go viral <clears throat> on YouTube or whatever any moment now because I think America loves to sing and I think Donnie Boy would really appreciate an anthem for King Donald. So, um, I'm going to do a reading. I actually, we were watching TV. Uh, Trump gave a news conference. Maybe some of you caught it. I have the latest breaking news from uh, our president. There are only 12 and a half people who have coronavirus. Most of them are doing perfectly fine. There's no problem. It's basically a hoax. One woman has died but she is expected to recover and will be home any moment now. However, and the news won't cover this, illegal Democrats are crossing the Mexican border to train radioactive gophers to attack Republican election sites. So anybody who wants to vote Republican, watch out for radioactive gophers trained by Democrats to destroy our democratic process. And now, and you have a flavor of my sense of humor, perhaps. Um, I will read from the book. I'll give you some tasty morsels. I don't want to divulge any plot points because you got to buy the book for that. But uh, I'll read from the, this is the um, epigraph. This is how the book starts. I actually quote a literary giant who I feel psychologically and philosophically aligned with. On some great and glorious day, the plain folk of the land will reach their heart's desire at last, and the White House will be adorned by a downright moron. That was written about a hundred years ago by H.L. Mencken from the Baltimore Sun, who was uh, renowned for his caustic remarks about politics. So now I'll start toward the beginning. Meet Donnie. His father had shortened the family name from Rumpelkarf to avoid embarrassment, but nine-year-old Donnie Rump seemed intent on causing the family a maximum amount anyway. When he wasn't skipping school, he was sent to the principal's office on a regular basis. In fact, his classmates coined a phrase for anyone sent to the principal, doing a Donnie. He wasn't the sharpest scholar even when he did show up to class. He proudly proclaimed, I never finished a whole book from start to finish. I'm smart enough to read a little bit here, a little bit there, and know better what the book is about than all those losers who waste their time reading a whole book. How he ascended grade to grade was a mystery. Between his truancy and zilch work ethic, he should have been held back. What Donnie was excellent at was perfecting the temper tantrum. These often ignited while playing Monopoly. I won! No, you didn't. Yeah, I have more money. You stole the money from the bank. No, I didn't. You're lying. We saw you take the extra money. 
No, you didn't. Yeah, we did. You're a cheater. You always cheat. Yeah? Then why do you play with me? Because you pay us. This exchange continued for another 15 minutes when Donnie would throw the board up in the air, sending pieces and dice flying. No problem for him. He knew the maid would clean it up. But it didn't end there. He kept screaming and fulminating for the next two days. I'm the only one who knows how to play Monopoly. The others are just jealous because they're dumb and weak. They lie about me because I'm too smart for them. They can just fry ice. When his ranting got to be too much for his parents, they'd entice him with a crisp hundred dollar bill, hook to a long fish fishing pole, and lure him into a soundproof rubber room. He then would bounce off the rubber walls like a frantic pinball scoring points. He actually enjoyed this a lot. The other thing he really enjoyed, perhaps even more than bouncing off the walls, was his lovely cousin Tara. Tara had clear blue eyes, a winsome smile, and long honey blonde hair. Her hair especially entranced Donnie. He had something of a hairstyle fixation in general, and he would stare for hours at photos of Frankie Avalon, Bobby Rydell, Bobby Darren, wishing he could have lush, wavy hair like theirs. See, he had short, mossy clumps, kind of like a chia pet. He'd wear a lot of caps to hide his unattractive, clumpy dome. Taryn, he would laugh and frolic, a couple of nine-year-olds. He would play with her luxurious hair, and she would tap his cap, yelling, is anybody home? And yes, they would frequently play doctor after which Donnie would present Tara with a bill for services rendered. Introducing Vladimir. Vladimir Putin was born into a family of KGB agents and apparatchiks during the early days of the Khrushchev regime. The family apartment was quite spacious by Soviet standards, denoting respect and accomplishment which the state held Papa Putin in. Vladimir was a short child, Perhaps he could uncharitably call, be called scrawny, which in fact his older brothers did. They often bullied him, throwing him into the Volga, saying, sink or swim. He was a bright lad, and unlike Donny, applied himself in school. But he was often scorned by his peers for his diminutive size. And un also unlike Donny, his father was not rich. He couldn't afford to buy him friends, so he was often alone. In addition to studies, Vladimir delved into what was known in the 1950s as physical culture. He bought muscle magazines, did weight training exercises pump pumping bulk bags of spelt, and performing the squat thrusts and jumping jacks as delineated in the Russian Army Manual. He was also fascinated by photos of Johnny Weissmuller as Tarzan, much as Donnie was wrapped by hairstyles of Frankie Avalon and Bobby Rydell. He dreamed of having a rippling chest, bulging biceps, and well-defined deltoids. If he achieved this dominant look, his peers would think twice about demeaning him. He could retaliate in a powerful and decisive manner. Oh yes, he would make them pay who looked down on him. Uh, Donnie, Donnie Rump, as I call him, uh, meets Roy King Kong, who is based loosely on Roy Cohn. If you remember, uh, Trump kept saying, where's my Roy Cohn? Where's the guy who's going to protect me? So I imagined fictionally their first meeting. Donnie finished his formal schooling, God knows how, and decided to go into the family business, real estate. Was his father thrilled? Remember, he had the emotional stability of a belligerent nine-year-old with an addict diagnosis of attention deficit disorder. This explained his low boredom threshold and his tendency to look into a pocket mirror every few minutes to check out his hair. He did have a personal appeal with the latest tonsorial technology involving weaves, implants, and rumored serial injections of Himalayan yak blood. His hair didn't look indeed look good. His father would send him to newly opened rump buildings for photo opportunities. He could turn on the charm of a brash nine-year-old and city officials would enjoy him. But there's a problem when photographers would snap a picture. When he smiled, it looked like he was trying to evacuate a particularly obstructive bowel movement. 
It looks like you're taking a dump, his father admonished. No, it doesn't. I'm just being wry. I don't need wry in front of my buildings. What do you want me to do? Practice your smile. Let me approve it before the next photo. Until then, just stand there. While Donnie was being an ornament in front of his father's buildings, he did have a chance to meet some influential metropolitan figures, none more so than Roy King Kong. Roy was notorious in political and elite social circles. Being an orphan on the Lower East Side, he eventually scrapped his way into Columbia's law school. He was admitted to the bar as one of their youngest uh, graduates. He gained renown for suborning the perjury by David Greenberg that helped convict and ep execute Mabel and Morris Rosenzweig for treason. He would later be disbarred for his own perjury, but at this historical moment, he was riding high, especially as a darling of the Republican Party. The Rump family often donated to Repub fundraisers, and he was met at these functions that Donnie and Roy first got together. Hi, Mr. Kong, I'm Donnie Rump. Roy, call me Roy, and stop calling yourself Donnie. It makes you sound like a moron. Call yourself Donald. Not even Don? No. Too much like a mafia capo. I just want to say how much my whole family admires you. Your strength and your wonderful sense of country patriotism. Thank you, Donald. The most important thing to do is to win. These god bleeding heart Jew liberals, and I'm a Jew so I can say that, crying spilt milk about the Rosenzweigs. So what if some Ruskies already knew the information that I divulged? It's important to set a precedent for these would-be do-gooder, one-worlder, liberal pinkos. And the message is, you don't fuck around with Roy Kong. The most important thing is to win. You don't fuck around with Roy Kong. Donnie Donald would take these pearls of wisdom to heart. Moving into, more through the book. So Donnie does this TV show called Paycheck, which is a huge hit. And every year, um, people with new shows would go to Las Vegas for prom promotional interviews and to try to stir up business. So this is Donnie in Vegas for the second time, actually. Isn't this terrific? I love coming here every year. Vegas is really America. Every kind of person coming here to spend money, maybe win a lot of money, and have a lot of fun and classy surroundings. Speaking of which, have you been to Rump Castle this year? We've added a thousand new rooms, 5,000 seat showroom, and the most beautiful hostesses this town has ever seen. So this year on Paycheck, be prepared for surprises. We're going to issue a health warning before the beginning of each show. If you have any heart or blood pressure problems, do not watch this program. This is on the advice of our legal team. And by the way, our advertising rates are going up. Now, questions. Uh, Donald, there are accusations that you've made unwanted sexual advances on contestants, staff, and others. Wait a sec, and you've also been paying hush money to women to keep them quiet about harassment. <coughs> Let me be honest with you. If you want to know the truth, I'll tell you. Believe me, I mean honestly. To tell you the truth, you can trust me. In all truthfulness, this is false reporting. It's fake news. Believe me, I mean, come on. Do I look like I need to harass women? I'm rich, I look great, and I'm rich. Believe me, if you want to know the truth, I have to beat them off with a stick, to be honest with you. My dance card is full, to tell you the honest truth, believe me. But women have come for, no, 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 not women, losers. Disgruntled losers looking for an illegitimate paycheck because they couldn't earn a real paycheck. Have you seen them? Doggy bow wows, to be honest with you. I mean, truthfully, do you think I'd ever be seen with them, let alone touch them? I mean, trust me. <clears throat> so Donald, what next? How long will you stay on the show? I don't know, as long as I'm having fun. You know me. If I feel I can't take 100%, I'll hand it over to somebody else. But right now we're making a lot of money, giving a huge audience some wonderful television, so what can I tell you? Except, stay tuned. 
So we go on. And this is the first meeting with Rump and Poutine, way before they, uh, he ever thinks about running for president. And it's called Rump in Russia, part one. After the Soviet Union's collapse, Rump International started alliances with Russian oligarchs. The business environment was free market capitalism without regulation, and the prospect of unfettered wealth was mouth-watering to Rump. He also salivated in the presence of young, beautiful women from the Eastern Bloc, and in fact married several of them. In addition to marriages, his deals included luxury apartment buildings, luxury car franchises, luxury gourmet food emporia, and a brothel with luxury red velour carpeting. Once Putin became president, the oligarchs mysteriously died, and Rump was compelled to deal with him personally. <coughs> the first meeting occurred 10 years before Donald's dive into the maelstrom of presidential politics. Mr. President, it is a pleasure to finally meet with you. I've always enjoyed my trips to your country, but my Russian is limited. You know, basically, comrade, da, and vodka. Do you have a translator? Mr. Donald Trump, I can speak English perfectly fine. I usually prefer not to, in deference to my people's wishes. <laughs> You're a cagey one, aren't you? Yes, I recently fought a tiger in a cage and won. Now, the reason I ask you here is to tell you we must renegotiate our deals which mutually benefit your company and my country. Go on. You must realize your former Russian partners are no longer available. Now, in addition to the 60-40 split in your favor, you create shell company that schemes 10% off the grosses of all rump Russian properties. Uh, yeah, you're Mr. Turnbulkakov is a good man. I don't mind the skimming, that's to be expected, but the split will be reversed. 70-30 in our favor, this is not negotiable. Everything is negotiable, Mr. President. Not this, Mr. Donald. We're fed up with America and Americans taking advantage of us. You will accept my terms, or we will simply take your properties. You read newspapers, yes? Occasionally. <laughs> then you know we have terminated several co-ventures between our two countries. The reason we, we're allowing you a generous 30% is your name has some value to us. 35%. 100% of smaller pot is still more advantageous. 34%. 31 33, 32 and a half. Vladimir just looked at him and smiled slightly. Done. Now let's go to Svetskaya brothel to ensure quality control is being maintained. Donald loved Russian prostitutes. They were usually younger, prettier, and wilder than their American counterparts. And the Russian prostitutes were willing to be sprayed with Lysol first to accommodate Rump's germophobic problem. American prostitutes usually re refused, bitching about stinging or some other such nonsense. Donald especially looked forward to hot, germ-free sex and side orders of the most delicious caviar, often eaten right off the girls' bodies. He wasn't opposed to mess, just germs. This was from Poutine's private stash. Not too salty, not too fishy, just the right blend of flavor when eaten off a woman's body. What Rump didn't know was all this brothel fun was being videotaped and preserved. This wasn't just because Poutine was a perv. It was simply standard procedure to videotape all American behavior everywhere. Since image was so important to Donald, had he known, he would have been more assiduous about cleaning the caviar from between his teeth. And let me read it. So obviously, I, I, again, I don't want to do major plot points because you have to buy the book. Um, but there's a sequence once he is president, he does some really terrible stuff that endangers the whole country. 
surprise, surprise, and some journalists are really beginning to question his competence. Rump's favorability rating hovered in the low 30s among the general public, and editorial pages were having a field day. Some of the more incendiary opinions were titled, Rump, America Grates on Rump, Rump in a Hole, and I Call Him Donnie Douchebag with More Than Due Respect. The highlight of that editorial was as follows. Some folks think it's disrespectful to call the President of the United States of America a douchebag, even though he has historically low ratings and is manifestly unfit and unqualified to be dog catcher, let alone president. People often use the phrase when describing it, with all due respect, blah, 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 meaning I don't want to seem to insult him, so I'll say, pay some deference to civility, but, well, when I write that Donnie Rump is a douchebag, it's because he's earned the insult honestly, and he's destroyed all norms of civility long ago. People ask me to explain why I call him a douchebag with more than due respect, so I'll tell you. A douchebag actually performs a useful function with competence. And I end the book after, I kind of describe the book as House of Cards, for those of you who know that TV show, wrapped in Monty Python on the way to Dr. Strangelove. But I end the book with a little poem that I say I heard on the uh, schoolyard, but actually I made it up. Trumpty Dumpty wanted a wall. Trumpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the law's women and all the law's men tried to put us together again. So, some questions about the book, or you know, what what do you feel about what you've heard? What yes. led you to to write this? Well, essentially, I, I started writing this shortly after the election in 2016, because myself, along with you know the 66 million people who did not vote for him, were kind of nauseous. And they couldn't believe it. And they were saying, what the heck is going on here? How could this guy be elected? He was so manifestly unqualified. He insulted everybody during the nominating process and during the candidacy. He was made a total jerk of himself. How could 63 million people in enough electoral states have voted the guy so he's now our president? So rather than staying you know, angry and sick to my stomach, I, I wrote the book. I started writing the book to essentially entertain myself and then I showed it to some people and the people said you know other people might enjoy this book other people feel fairly upset about this election so maybe you should keep writing and, and create a narrative structure so I created a plot I started writing little you know anecdotes and jokes and stuff like that but then I wove something when he, starting with both Putin and, and Rump as uh, nine-year-olds and seeing I, I ping pong back and forth Every other chapter goes back and forth for the first like six or seven chapters. And uh, I mean, unfortunately, it's more relevant now perhaps than when I first started writing it. Because here we are in another election season and he's doing the same old crap all over again. And um, he just pulls stuff out of his butt. He just makes stuff up and people, it's a cult, I think. People just nod and, you know, yes, sir, yes, sir. And if you watch in, in all of his lackeys, I don't know if he ever had pets. I know we have a pet here in the audience uh, because I think they all would have died. I don't think he would have taken care of them. But now he has a whole Congress full of lap dogs. He has a whole Congress full of poodles who just lick his hand and say, yes, master. And whatever they say, because, you know, he just stands in the back. Um, oh, I forgot. I, there's another little bit. I, I, I meant to read. I'll, I'll read it now where he like imitates Mussolini. He was told, yeah, he was told by some people he should study both Hitler <laughs> and Mussolini, not for their ideology, but learning how to, you know, amass a crowd and handle group dynamics. So as he proclaims in the book, he doesn't like reading. He can't read anything, really. He can read a paragraph, especially if it has his name on it. So I have a chapter called Reading Here and There. Donald didn't have the patience to actually read a whole book, but he could occasionally read a whole page here and there. He kept copies of Mein Kampf, 
by his bedside. And parenthetically, his first wife, Ivana, confirms this. He used to have a copy of Mein Kampf to learn about group. I mean, that's what she said way before the presidential race. So he kept the book by his bedside and, and tucked into several Hitlerisms that made a strong impression. What luck for rulers that men do not think. That's true. I don't spend a lot of time thinking. The great masses of people will more easily fall victim to a big lie than a small one. <coughs> yeah, I can buy that. Go big or go home. The art of leadership consists in consolidating the attention of the people against a single enemy and taking care that nothing else will split up that attention. That makes sense. Nothing unifies a country like war against an enemy. It is not truth that matters, but victory. I could have written that myself. Rump also watched footage of Hitler and Mussolini together at a conference, or what he thought was footage. It was actually part of Charlie Chaplin's film, The Great Dictator, but he didn't know the difference. Donald was impressed with Mussolini's physically intimidating presence, and if you watch him in the 19th, he was rocking back and forth and jutting out his chin like Mussolini. Except it was actually comedian Jack Oakey doing a Mussolini impersonation. Donald jutted his chin out, folded his arms, and rocked his feet side to side. It is not truth that is important but victory. Donnie felt good, real good. And he had much better looking hair than Benito, who of course was bald. So I thought I would just include that as part of the philosophy. Yes? Summarize some key points. Uh, that it's important to laugh, especially in dire uh, political times or emotional times. Uh, laughter saves our lives and mocking laughter somebody asked is there a danger in laughing off Trump and I said yeah laughing him off is dangerous because that normalizes him this book does not laugh him off it laughs at him and that I think is critical in our country with the First Amendment this guy needs to be mocked and satirized every day and twice on Sundays and he really hates that He'd rather have people scream at him than people laughing at him. Because I think as a, as a broken child, he was probably laughed at a lot. And living in the borough, outer borough of New York, not Manhattan, he was always considered eh, this kind of creepy guy who pretends he's somebody else and does PR for him as John Barron. He literally would call the New York Post and say, uh, this is John Barron, and uh, I want to talk about Donald Trump. I saw him, and he's wonderful. You know, he literally would do that he'd call up newspapers as a phony guy. And so I think he's led his life as kind of this phony, made up image that enough of America has bought that they elected him president. So that the major point is to keep laughing. And um, a, a little personal story, I, eight years ago, um, I was diagnosed with leukemia, acute leukemia. And this came out of nowhere. I'm not a smoker. I led a relatively healthy life. I'll do a Marco Rubio and have some water. And I mean, the funny thing is, I was diagnosed with extreme anemia first, and they don't, didn't know what was causing it. And it kind of turned into, they said, you got a leukemia. You need to go into extreme chemo right now. So, you know, chemo takes your energy away, and you can't do much. But um, my wife, who's sitting here in the first row, uh, brought some Monty Python discs and some Faulty Towers and some Marx Brothers and some Preston Sturge, stuff that she knew would make me laugh. And laughter is so critical, regardless if you're feeling bad about politics or your own health, because it gives you psychological benefit. And physiologically, it's like if you're walking fast or doing a short run. It works the heart and the lungs. So I, I'm hoping people will buy the book, uh, as I think the, the uh, uh, owner of the store, the manager said, some per one person wrote, not a relative, not my wife, and not my mother, it, this is one of the funniest books I've ever read. 
Mr. Trevor has created, in my opinion, a masterpiece. And Kirkus, which is a highly respected uh, critical rating agency, said this is a hilarious rendering of the contemporary political scene. Um, so I'm hoping that people, I mean, unlike, I'm not a journalist. I mean, maybe some of you, I was, well, it was a fairly young audience. I was, uh, 20 years ago, I was on the TV series Xena and Hercules. And so I am used to making people laugh as an actor. I didn't write my own script, but I would write a punchline here and there. And uh, in the book, I hope people will come away and say, yeah. And the laughter isn't laughing him off, and it's not avoiding the problem. I don't know if you've ever seen a film called Dr. Strangelove, which I mentioned earlier. It's one of the funniest novel movies ever made. But it doesn't. It didn't make people forget about nuclear holocaust or nuclear warfare. It emphasized the need. This can be so ridiculous, but all of us can lose our lives. Trump can be so ridiculous, but he must not be reelected. I mean, it's to make people. Again, I would love. One of my fondest hopes is to, for this book to appear in a tweet. So if anybody knows anybody who can get to Donald Trump and say, "Who is this clown making fun of me?" That will a sell a lot of books and b. It will, it will impinge upon this uh, very thin veneer. Because he really is playing the part of president, like he was playing the part of Donald Trump. You, you know, that was not the real Donald Trump on The Apprentice. Mark Burnett, yeah, Mark Burnett came up with this image of Trump and the boardroom and your fuck. It was a closely held company, he had crap all over his desk. So it was an image that America, a lot of America, bought for 12 years. But it was not really him. So now he's playing a version of who he thinks the president should be. My feet are getting a little tired. Can I, can I sit? Can I, is, is sitting here good? Okay. Um, he was playing a version that, that kind of, and his first couple of months when he was actually surrounding himself with people who knew something and they disagreed with him, he found out as president, he didn't have to take it. He can hire anybody he wants. They all serve at the pleasure of the president. And so now he literally has, he doesn't have a cabinet. He has a bunch of lapdogs. He has a bunch of, of shills who are essentially just boosting his ego. And so this book, I mean, in a way I wish it weren't so relevant, but now it's even more relevant than when I wrote it to hopefully make sure the guy doesn't get reelected. So, yes, question? So, according to David K. Johnson, yes. uh, he, he also plays a billionaire. Yes. Yeah, you know, David K. Johnson says you have more money than Trump. Yeah. Oh, he said that? Yeah. David K. has more money than Trump. No. Uh, you, anybody. Anybody has, has more, more money, money than Trump. Because he's in hot up to his hand pocket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's right. lost so much. He's Yeah, he plays the part of a billionaire. He, and he played the part of a playboy. He, he was such, apparently, his father always thought the other brother would inherit Fred, the one who died of alcoholism. And in fact, I was at a signing recently, and somebody said, you know, I grew up in Queens, and I knew Fred Trump, who built a, an empire and gave Donnie all his money. And Fred would refer to the other son, oh, there's dumb Donnie. That's my other son. Now, if your father keeps calling you dumb Donnie, that's got to have a little bit of a psychological impact. And so I think he has this bottomless well that can never be filled. The problem is he's president of the United States. I mean, it wouldn't be so bad if he didn't have the power over all of us one way or another. But he's got this bottomless need for endless flattery. And yeah, he, was, he played the part of a billionaire. Exactly. And he's playing the part of president. And a lot of people said he really didn't want to be president. He wanted to run, lose, and then get his own TV show again. He wanted to go back on TV. And what's really personally annoying to me we're both members of the same union. He's a member of Screen Actors Guild. I'm a member of Screen Actors Guild. My dues are helping to pay for his pension. And that really galls me because I'm sure he does not give it to charity. We remember the famous Trump charity. Total bullshit. I mean, and I don't know why he wasn't, well, he's president, so nobody will charge him with it. He should have been charged with fraud. He just agreed to close the charity and like refund the money. But the money went to pay for his portrait at Mar- Mar-a-Lago. So I'm not sure how he's going to refund that. Um, yeah, I mean, he's, he's got this. And I, the book, and I, as I say, I don't want to give major plot points, but there are turning points in the book. One of the reviewers actually said, 
Um, and it's, it's just, this is a hysterical book. It, it, in the midst of all, the book has light and humor, and in the midst of all the dark elements of today's world, it's hard not to appreciate this literature all the more for it. And finally, when we are not sure where the story can go beyond the present day, this parody continues with the deliberately absurd until the very end, with fireworks the reader can't even dream of. So, you know, it, I, I don't, I didn't want to give too many plot points away because then, you know, why buy the book? Um, so, some more questions. Any, any plans to make it to a stage play? Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that. A friend of mine said, you know, this would really make a good stage play. Um, I, I want to sell enough books that there'd be interest in financing. I mean, I mean, I hate to say this, and I, and I really hope I'm wrong, because I really hope he doesn't get reelected. If he does get reelected, the book probably will sell even more. If he doesn't, I'm willing to have it be a period piece. I'm perfectly happy to have somebody else who knows what they're doing. But yeah, I mean, I've thought about that. I've thought about that. Um, again, it's, it's, it's a very readable book. It's 183 pages. It's short chapters. You can probably read it in one sitting of maybe three or four hours. What? The question. Well, 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 it's possible. I'm not, I'm not putting, I don't want to put my own money into that. I mean, I did. Have you talked to maybe uh, some film directors, maybe, that you may know? They well, I do know some film. Again, it could. It, it has to it has to sell f in other words there has to be an audience primed to want to see it because that's I mean this I mean I I, I self-published because an, a traditional publisher and agent was interested but they said you realize that the lead time this probably would not come out if we can sell this until after the next election and I said, no, 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 it's, this has got to come out before the 2020 election. The only way I could do that was to self-publish. But to self-finance a movie or a play, we're talking major dollars that I don't have. Maybe Donnie could contribute. I mean, the ironic thing about Trump is, Trump, uh, is that his father gave him and his sister, like, you know, $300 million to avoid a tax thing. And that way he could hike the rents of his renters claiming they were making improvements, but they weren't. But but Fred Sr. had the receipts to show that he'd paid out $300 million. People were saying if Trump had kept that money in medium-yielding bonds from the time he was a kid, he'd be richer than he is now. I mean, he'd absolutely have more money in the bank. But the guy loved rolling the dice. He loved the, the, he loved play. the problem is he's rolling the dice with our country. He's rolling the dice with the future of us. And, you know, rather than getting s screaming or nauseous, you know, you read the book and at least you can laugh. And I really would like that song to take off. The, when the, da I mean, I hope America, I mean, I hope a little group starts singing outside the Republican convention, you know. I think that would be wonderful if, if that song would somehow take off. So, yes? So following up on yeah. that, you know, that, you know, basically, Trump is a walking fraud. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Uh, you know, so it's kind of troubling. You know, that just doesn't, you know, get exposed by the media, and we know that the media uh, makes a lot of money off Trump. Yes, they do. Cable, especially the twenty, the cable news channels are all raking in huge bucks, left or right. Absolutely. Yeah, but, but you know, how does this guy? How could this be even possible if we had like a free press in the United States? You know, we would think that's the for the state. Yeah. Their job is to expose things. Well, media tried. I, I subscribe to the Nation. I subscribe to uh, uh, the New Republic. They've written major. They wrote major articles. New York Magazine tried exposing him. The problem is, I don't know if it's just Americans. Maybe it's all people. Love to be taken in even if they know it's a fraud. It's the Barnum and Bailey thing, you know? This way to the ego, I mean, people, the, the, the five-headed woman, they knew that stuff was crap, but they love to be taken in. The difference is electing a president as opposed to going to a sideshow. But there's something, and I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna knock Americans, there may be something in just all humans that love, no, that can't, love the conspiracy, you know? That can't be, could it be true? 
maybe in fact one of the reviewers said this is obviously a satire but the points that I'm making people maybe there's a thing where he, that that cousin he has a crush on he he loses all of his hair as a kid and one day he cuts off his cousin's hair and he staples it to his own head and he has such a thick head that it doesn't hurt and I I made that up as far as I know but what people are saying given Trump's behavior maybe he could have done that you know that he could have done the most outrageous thing because he's already done so many outrageous things and people people are entertained I mean I think there was a book wasn't there we're entertaining ourselves to death in the 80s or the 90s but yes yeah we're enter and that was way before Trump but that like in infotainment everything has to be entertaining and it's like the guy knows how to do a cliffhanger his line is you know stay tuned we don't know what's gonna happen this uh, this coronavirus no chances are it'll be okay but it could get worse stay tuned we're doing our but the most important thing America is I'm doing the best job that anybody's ever done in the history of our country you can rest assured my credibility is oh and what did some what did somebody say recently about Trump about oh about the impeachment um, after he was acquitted or before he was acquitted and it was it was a congressman saying well you can always take Donald Trump at his word <laughs> and the person was serious and the rest of the people in the audience didn't gag you can always take Trump at his word the only genuinely honest thing I think he ever said recently was I love the poorly educated yes Donald I believe that you absolutely believe that and the poorly educated of course a lot of well-educated very rich people look at their bottom line and their bank would say ah, he's, he hasn't blown up the world yet I'm doing I'm doing great my pension fund is doing great and they're theoretically well educated but they're willing to sacrifice the welfare of our country for their own private interests which is a tad problematic in terms of the body politic you know oh yes yes so I was looking on Facebook and I saw this thing it said that uh, Trump uh, said that if he was going to run for office he would do it as a pre as a Republican because they would believe anything so They'll believe anything. Is that what you I looked that up on Snopes, and it's not true. Uh huh. He didn't say that. Yeah. But his son-in-law did, Kirshner. Uh huh. It was a Newsweek interview. So it's it's uh, if you look that up, it's on Newsweek.com, right? Really. But he was uh, this. So Jared Kushner actually did make that comment that Republicans. That, you know, the, the person asked him about, you know, the. Uh, Obama conspiracy that he wasn't a citizen. Right, yes, right? yes, and yes. That's why he kept on going on about that. Uh huh. Then he just let the cat out of the bag, you know, and Trump doesn't really believe that. Mm -hmm. But he knew that that would get the Republicans going because yes. they'd swallow it. Right. And uh, and they did. Yeah. And they, But it's the same thing about the wall. He didn't really give a damn about the wall, but he started saying it at rallies. And tr one of his talents, maybe his only talent aside from branding and lying, he can pick up the vibe. He can pick up what the audience is, and as an actor and a stage actor, I understand that. You kind of feed off what the audience is giving you, right? And he, the wall, the wall, build that wall. He didn't give a damn about that, and he never thought Mexico was gonna pay for it either. But he just repeated it often enough, and it got to become a meme, it got to became, and that's true about, by the way, I'm not sure Democrats are absolutely immune to that. You know what I mean? Because as I said, there's something... Democrats are not inherently brighter or inherently... Maybe some of them can read a whole book. But many Republicans can read a book, too, from what I understand. And it's possible to be seduced. People love to be seduced. They love to be conned. Why are lotteries so popular? A person who becomes a lottery addict, if they just put that money every week if they buy it, for years and years and put it into a, like a, a bond fund, they would absolutely have like five thousand, ten thousand dollars But the idea that, you know, well, with one ticket, it could change my life. And the irony is, for those who know about lotteries or play lotteries, obviously it's like being struck by lightning while you're in a sailboat in the middle of like the Antarctic. The chances are one in several billion. But those who win the lottery 
often have their lives changed for the worse. There's a documentary about like lottery winners anonymous. They've won the big bucks and their lives have become miserable. First of all, they think they're getting all the money in one fell swoop. They're not aware of taxes. Second of all, people come out of the woodwork. Hey, you won the lottery, man. Can you lend me 50,000? They also quit their jobs. They often get divorced. I mean, winning the lottery is not such a great thing. A lot of lottery winners have their lives ruined, but it's that, that willingness like, that can save me, that can change my life, as opposed to, I need to change my life if I want to, in small increments, and not be conned. Because I gotta tell you, in my opinion, I won't mention any names, there are con men on both sides of the aisle. And I mean, it's a small group here, I don't think I'll offend too many. I mean, we, if you've heard, thing called Operation Chaos in South Carolina, Republicans being convinced to vote for Bernie because he can cross over because they think Bernie will be the weaker candidate. And Vladimir Putin has also decided to put money in the back channels on Facebook on trolls supporting Bernie and denigrating all the other Democratic candidates. And it's not because Putin wants Bernie to win. It's because they think Trump can roll over him. So there are people willing to be conned one way or the other. And I think one of the quotes, and it is a quote from Mein Kampf, how lucky for leaders that men do not think. Men and women, people, do not think. Because they want Zorro. They want the Black Knight. They want somebody to save them. They want and they think that somebody is capable of doing that. And somebody like Trump and others will be happy to take that mantle. I'll save you. Make America great. Now, my book, by the way, when I say make, make America great, it's G-R-A-T-E. Make America great again. The first time he says it, saying, we're being played for patsies. Europeans just, you know, do, you know, we're going to grate on them. And in my book, Mallory Claxton is in for Hillary Clinton. I'm going to grate on Mallory Claxton like nobody's business. And he is a very grating personality. But, but people have the... Uh, have the appetite and it's something look I there's something else in the book that I mentioned I'll sit down for a second um, aside from being sickened when he was elected two of the characters that people that you can see me on YouTube if you go to my website by the way website Robert Trevor dot net that's R O B as in boy E R T T R E B as in boy O R dot net you can see clips of me in these two parts the first role was opposite Martin Sheen in a film called Out of the Darkness. And I played the psychopath, son of Sam. I played a serial killer. Not funny. I had done a lot of comedy till then, but if you see sometimes comic actors have a very dark side and they can be very effective. So I played a psychopath and then I'm well known in some areas for playing a salesman. Salmonius on Hercules and Xena who was this cheerful guy, and he wouldn't look at the fine print. <laughs> He'd sell, you know, armor that would melt in the rain. But the idea was he was splashy and, and flashy. And so I said, having played a psychopath and having played a salesman gives me credentials to write about Donald Trump because he is kind of the intersection of psychopath and salesman. So all of us, I mean, actors and writers maybe have access to stuff that we're willing to reveal but every person, every voter, has dark and light stuff that can be susceptible to dark and light influences. But when you have a guy like Trump, who, by the way, even though I, people are going to say, are you comparing Trump to Hitler? Not at all. He quotes Hitler in terms of how to handle a group. Hitler was ideological. Trump has no ideology other than Trump. Trump uber alles. Trump's major agenda, the first 10 things are Trump, 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 Ivanka, Jared, Trump. And so if, some, if he does something that is in America's interest, along with his own, he won't be opposed. He's not gonna, he doesn't cut off his nose to, to spite his face. But his major agenda is always Trump, all Trump all the time, which obviously Hitler had this dangerous Machiavelli poisoned concept of I am going to move the race forward by eliminating the Ubermensches. 
That's not Trump's interest at all. He has no ideology. So I don't want people to say, oh, you're quoting Trump, quoting Hitler. Well, yeah, because his first wife said he would read Hitler to understand group dynamics, how to mold a crowd, and he's good at that. He knows how to feed off the crowd. I don't think he's a very good actor, because if you're speaking as one, as I remember, he, he's a member of Screen Actors Guild for his TV show. But to be a really good actor, you have to have empathy. You have to be able to put yourself into somebody else's shoes. And he is absolutely incapable of that. He has no empathy whatsoever. He can't even fake it. And maybe that's why some people like, because he's honest. Well, he's honest about his fraud. I mean, you know, I'm the great. He, he doesn't try to do anything covert. He doesn't try to do something back channel. He does it out in the open. His conning and his fraudulence and his grifting is right out there. And unfortunately, there are enough people who are susceptible to that, even though, look, the Congress knew he did, he did impeachable acts. And they, they told the prosecutors that. We know, but, you know, we, I, I want to stay and have a job. My base, my voters like him. I can't vote to, that's why you got to give, uh, um, what's his, yeah, the, uh, the one guy who voted uh, for, for removal. The guy from Utah, who formerly from Massachusetts. Romney. 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 Mitt Romney. A lot of credit. And now it's Mitt Romney obviously was the Republican candidate for president, uh, what, 12 years ago, against uh, Obama's second term. And now he's not, you know, he was told, don't show up to any Republican function. Do not show up to CPAC, the Conservative Public Action Committee. You will be in danger. It's not just you will be booed. You, your corpus, your physical personhood, will be in danger. That's pretty disgusting, you know? But that's, and, and I'm not sure Democrats are immune from that. But Republicans play dirty more often, like this Operation Chaos thing. And, and <laughs> back in Nixon's time, I don't know, this is you know, commercial free and I won't scream it too loud. In Nixon's day, it was called rat uh, Lee Atwater and uh, Lucianne Goldberg literally wanted to get George McGovern to be the nominee against Nixon instead of Edmund Muskie. Edmund Muskie could have beaten Nixon possibly as opposed to George McGovern. So in those days, before Twitter, before social media, they somehow through print media and through the telephone got people, got Democrats and Republicans to say, we got to go for McGovern. And Edmund Muskie had the smarts and the integrity and the experience again to give Nixon a good run McGovern was the nominee and Nixon took 49 states just a little cautionary thing but in those the Republicans play dirtier more often than Democrats Democrats are a little too much Marcos of Queensberry stuff I mean John Kerry the swift boat horse that they were saying oh he wasn't and, and, and Kerry didn't want to get into it he should have gotten into it he didn't earn the medals honestly those guys were lying the swift boat liars for job. I mean, they were rampantly lying and being paid off by the Republican Party. So the problem is Democrats don't want to fight as dirty as Republicans, which is a problem because as commentators have said, whoever runs against Trump, don't think you're not going to get down in the mud. Don't think when they go low, we go high. Not so much. Not such a good plan if you want to win. Now, if you want to keep your integrity, you probably don't run for office in the first place, which is a problem because that means the best people won't run because they know they, in these days of Twitter and social media and Facebook and Russia trolls and all this nonsense, I don't see how you can possibly run and win unless you're willing to get as dirty as your opponent. And so that makes for good television. <laughs> I mean, the last Democratic debate, which got into some stuff, was, was pretty compelling television. Um, a reasoned, measured rendering of your values. People can't take it. They're put to, people need the jazz. People need... It, it, the interesting thing is, in the uh, I got a kind of arcane hornet's nest of non-relevant facts. The play Man for All Seasons, uh, Thomas More, and the king, King Henry VIII, who was a little Trumpy, actually. He was flashing, he married, you know, eight women, and, you know, he killed them. Trump didn't, as far as we know. But 
so, uh, Trump, uh, 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 Henry wants Thomas More's approval because he knows Thomas More is unimpeachable. He's a moral man. He has the respect of everybody. You can't buy him off. And so King Henry VIII wants Thomas More's approval for his new wedding. And he said, Thomas, Thomas, you're an honest man. God damn you. And I don't, I don't know, I'm paraphrasing, I don't know that many honest men. Look, people like me because I'm big because I've had all these women, because I sing and dance. And some people want me because they want anything that moves. They'll follow anything that moves. This is way before, this is like what, the 16th century? When was Henry Thomas More? Six? People have this endemic. It's endemic within them. It's just that Twitter and Facebook can put it on speed dial. They can gin it up to astronomical proportions, which can be super dangerous. But everybody has this tendency to watch anything that moves, as opposed to thinking about what's going on. And that it's important to have a voice. So hopefully you'll, she'll work on you to be able to project a little better, a little more. Because you know you're quiet, right? Is that why you're taking the public speaking course? You gotta get your voice out, it's important. But it's important for all of us to get our voice out. Every, that's, we have a great country. And part of the greatness is the freedom of speech. That, but to have, to, to exercise freedom of speech, you have to get the speech out. If the speech just stays within, now you can get it out by talking, or you can get it out by writing, or you can get it out you know, lots of different ways. But if you just say, oh, my speech isn't important, who's gonna listen to me? That's not what made this country great. And then you, you, you align with like-minded people and you know, you have a group. So I guess, sh sh we are we good? Yeah. We're good, so anybody, uh, shall I do some signing? Anybody want some books? Oh boy. Well, <laughs> I'm glad I didn't rely on the signing part to take up some of the uh, time. Yes?